All right, before we go there, uh, I'd like to reconvene the uh, special Corporate Administrative Services Committee meeting that we started bright and early yesterday morning at 9.30. Thank you all for being here. We have um, a number of items to get through today, and we're going to start with Annex S, page 167 to 174. And we did receive all the reports, so we're good to go. We get to turn over to Mr. Rosenboom. Is it uh, Tina starting this one? Tina starting first. Okay. Sorry, you have to wait to eat that later. <laughs> Thanks, Tina. <laughs> So staff have prepared a uh, report here in order to uh, assist the board in making their decisions in regards to the financial implications for the water budget proposals. There are several budget proposals and uh, the next step would be for us to amend the fees and charges as well as the parcel tax and that's anticipated to come forward in January. Uh, there are several budget proposals here, uh, more than what we've anticipated in the future. Uh, if you recall, in the January uh, amendments to the user fees and parcel taxes, staff had already anticipated that the rate model that we were using as part of the Comprehensive Regional Water Plan uh, needed some updates because some of the projects were uh, either more expensive or expedited and so the rate model um, was no longer really useful for us. So included in this particular uh, report gives a few scenarios as to what some implications to some of these projects are. There are still even some items that are in flux and that is the groundwater investigation next phase. So there's a few to be determined in the budget proposal so you'll, you're even getting more information coming forward. So it might amend some of these values uh, further, um, depending on how we fund some of these projects and even the timing of how we fund some of the projects. So again, this is just for information. Um, there's no decision to be made at this particular time. The decisions will be made in January. So I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you. And to the directors. Director Ties. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, my question is, uh, of those three scenarios, um, I guess we don't have a complete picture of our asset management yet, so um, we're not quite certain as to um, <clears throat> what an adequate reserve contribution actually should be. And, and uh, so I'm wondering, um, is, are all of those three conservative? Um, going with current levels of knowledge or is is there some sort of a method methodology to your madness so there's past practice so part of the comprehensive regional water plan um, it identified having a minimum balance of about five million dollars in the uh, operating in I think three million in or in the capital and three million in the operating reserve so that wasn't, um, what we, staff have seen is that that wasn't tied to any rationale in the sense of uh, tying it to percentage of assets or life cycle of assets. We know that value should be far higher based on the replacement costs and timing of these uh, type of assets. Um, so you're correct in saying there with that information, it will inform us further as to what those values should be. So when you say method to the madness, I think you have to understand and you're even witnessing that these particular projects are very costly. And so having um, five million dollars is, is quite, is not a very big amount in there. And so recommending to contribute a million per year is really it's quite conservative, really. Any other questions? Council Director Hiltz. Sure, thanks. Um, the, the method of contribution. Um, these Sometimes play people I see the um, asset levies and things like this, like as a, as a bump up one time options. Has this ever been considered with the, with the regional district as a, as a method of uh, boosting the uh, reserves? That's in some essence what is happening in some of the functions. So even yesterday's budget proposals to top up the protective services, that is based on the work we did for their asset management plans and timing when they need to replace. So um, 
yes, that is even some of the recommendations that are going to come out of the wastewater plans as well. Um, and that's part of the parcel tax side of the house. So the, the use of the language asset levy seems to be kind of a, a more of an informative term than user fees. I'm wondering in terms, terms of present, presenting to the public how those kinds of that language affects the, 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 how the public receives the information. In a regional district, um, so you have a reserve that's a capital reserve. So um, in a municipality, they're a little more flexible. So typically you do see those type of um, funds in a, in a municipality because they, they do it. But we, we could do that. It just means you may have to have another statutory bylaw. Um, it might restrict you or you might want to amend your bylaw. Um, it's essentially for capital replacement. So how we present it to the public, most certainly we can use some different language. I think that's what staff's realizing as we start to go to the public for these things so they understand what the purpose of it is. Director Kroll. Um, this is just something I wanted to share. Um, in Gibson's just recently, we got our water bills. And um, we pay $1.39 per cubic meter for water. That's the base rate. And if you use more, if you use over 139 cubic meters, it goes up to $1.86. And over 276 cubic meters, it goes up to 236 so water in the regional district, just as a casual observation, is an incredible bargain. It's 54 cents per cubic meter less than what we're paying in Gibsons. And we only have an infrastructure to maintain within two square miles. Um, so I think, you know, just as an observation, people in the regional district have really been getting a, a huge bargain. I've had people recently from Manitoba and from Ontario who've come and said it's like we're paying peanuts, they pay four times what we're paying, right? So, yeah, it is um, reasonable. Any other questions from directors? Okay, do you have a question? No. Okay. All right. I wanted to just okay, correct, director. Go ahead. So at this point, we are not going to uh, uh, provisionally stick anything in the budget for uh, in increase of fees to go to reserves or we're just going to leave that conversation till round two? I think we're looking at once we do all the water stuff, then we'll have to do user fees and parcel taxes. So this is just to provide the background for that. So on page 169, actually all of the pages, uh, 169, it shows the opening uncommitted balance at 6873670 at the beginning of 2019. And that is combined operating and capital reserves. During 2019, we spent 3156700 So we're starting 2020. Um, at this point, with the numbers and the bills and all that kind of stuff that we have in, there might be some change in that. 3716970 So if we're looking at a $5 million minimum, if you go over to uh, scenario, well, two and three, two puts $1 million into reserve, still keeps us under the $5 million. Even with the $2 million, we're under what we started 2019 at. Right? So just keep in mind as we're moving <coughs> forward. Okay. Any other questions on this report? Remco, you want to say something? Just want to make sure that we're all, um, the intent is we started, we would, we are starting at the moment at 6,873,000. So it's not as of first gen January okay. 1st. Last year it's okay. as, as January 1st. Of 2020. 2020. Okay. So and then, and so we're looking at how do we end 2020 given all of this stuff coming forward. Okay, perfect, Correct. thank you. Okay, clarity helps. Any other questions in this report? All right, let's move on. Annex T, this is pages 175 to 209. Over to Remco. Thank you, Chair Cedars. 
The following budget proposals are those related to the Regional Water System Service. This year, the focus has been on budget proposals that are presented for four reasons. One is to meet regulatory requirements. Two, to prevent imminent asset failures from occurring. Three, to replace infrastructure that is at or beyond its useful life and experiencing high maintenance and repair costs. And four, to implement the strategies identified in the board strategic plan. Staff realizes that the total number of proposals and the requested amount is very substantial. Staff have identified three drivers for this. One is the board 2019-23 uh, strategic plan, which recognizes that the challenges associated with our water supply are significant and require immediate and significant efforts to address. The second one is that there is a shared desire by the SRD and the community to more actively engage with each other in the efforts to address these water challenges. And three, that while the corporate asset management plan was adopted in 2015, the philosophy behind this type of management is only very recently more actively being applied to the hundreds of millions of water assets. This is resulting in a more proactive approach to the maintenance and replacements of our assets. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think what we're going to do is take these, Director Lee, go ahead. I had a couple questions on this one. Um, the user, this is all covered by user fees, right? So would there be a grant on this and do we know? This is um, the, the budget proposals are a combination of user fees, parcel tax, and operating capital reserves. Um, it's um, we are we are not able to rely on grants for budget proposals that we're proposing. We can apply for grants, but uh, they need to be covered off by one of the other uh, means of funding. Follow up. Um, on this uh, proposal, are um, are you are we uh, looking to put this forward into the budget the way it is? Is that what we're up to here? So, are you talking about a particular budget proposal in our package here, or yeah? This, okay, this we're going to go through them one by one. Oh, we are. Later we're going to go through them one by one. Okay. Okay, so that we can identify them. And we'll do it. What I was going to say is we'll do them in categories. If you look at Page 175 and 176, so item number one, this is imminent asset failure. So request for $250,000 for the Cove K pump station rebuild and access, access improvements uh, coming out of capital reserves. So what would the directors like to do? First of all, questions on this. Yeah, Director McMahon. Is this road a multi-road? <laughs> I, I believe it is is in a multi right of way, but they don't maintain this road. All right. Does everybody have their budget uh, recommendation sheet? You're going to get that, okay? Everybody else has theirs. Okay. We'll wait for a minute till Director Lee gets his. He was getting so good at making recommendations. It's up to you. I mean, does anybody have any questions about this? I mean, we'll all be voting on this, right? But is do you have any? Does anybody have any questions on this one? Yeah, go ahead. Before we spend, um, do we, can we um, talk to the residents that are on this to see what they would like done? Is that a possibility? Thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, the situation at this pump station is such that um, any delays in replacing it could result in no water supply to those residents. So that's why we have categorized it as imminent asset failure. Um, we currently, we have we used to have two pumps. We currently only have one pump running. Um, so it's really 
um, important to replace uh, this asset in its entirety as uh, soon as we can. Thank you. Is there a follow-up? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, part of the uh, part of the request was for to pave a, dry, a road and to put a new intake line in, and uh, neither one of them I wouldn't call that as. My question is: Are those ones mandatory? To me, they seem like they might be this year or next year kind of things. Okay, so you're looking at separating out which are mandatory and imminent and have to be done now, and which could be put off to future. That's my thought process, yes. Thank you. Okay, staff? The entire um, pump station intake structure is, is rather old. Um, I, I would suggest replacing the intake if we're upgrading the pump station. The road access is very challenging. Even they have troubles going up and down it with 4x4 four four vehicles. Um, and uh, we take sodium hypochlorite down to the station, so they need to drive down there. We've tried maintaining it with gravel, and it always kicks out. So we're suggesting uh, it would be more efficient to put a hard surface on it. So your question was, okay, so the question was, does all of it need to be done this year? Um, or could it be spread over a couple of years? That's the question. And I, so if, if we're replacing the intake, which I understand if you're doing the pump, you're going to do that piece as well, does that impact the road, putting that in, so that we're going to be doing work on the road already? No, it doesn't. The, um, you're correct that the road itself would be a sub part of this project, yes. Like we're not, we're not digging up the road to replace a water main. We're trying to improve the access to the pump station. So I'll follow up one more, and then I'll go to the other directors. Yes, this is my last question. Um, I, I would. This is a small service area in a small community. Um, I, I would like to consult the people, and I actually haven't because it's haven't got there yet. Um, but we can do that later. So I'll move this. Um, that the following budget proposal be approved and incorporated into the 2020 round two budget. Okay, is there a seconder for that recommendation? Okay. And then Director Hiltz had a question, and Director McMahon. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, my, my questions were um, the age of the existing pump station and then the redundancy. It's, it's a two pump station, pump station, but only one is functioning, so there is essentially no redundancy in this pump station at this point in time. That's correct. Staff are working uh, right now to try and get a, a temporary pump in. The, the pump station did have two pumps in it. One has failed. The follow-up is the age of the, of the facility? Off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly, but I know we took it over in, I believe, in the 90s, and at that time it was an old pump station. So, so this was an asset that was a developer, and then the SCRD acquired it. This is another one of these kind of things that we acquire that we didn't necessarily know that we were going to be acquiring? Is that, it sounds like the wastewater kind of yeah, water exactly. systems that have been kind of turned over to the regional district and the condition that they're turned over in isn't necessarily the standard that we would be liking and it's kind of come to the end and it's, uh, there's no redundancy, there's not much of a backup so the community would be without water if this fails. It was a system we took over, similar to other systems we've taken over over the years. And uh, pretty soon after we took over the system, we replaced the reservoir with a steel reservoir, took out a wood stave reservoir, but this pump station hasn't had an upgrade. So this pump station is old. So it's not necessarily that it wasn't in decent shape when we took it over. It's over 20 years old now. I mean, we're starting to replace stuff in seashell, same thing, because, you know, for our wastewater, for example, because they're on, in operation all the time. They take a lot of abuse and they wear out. Yeah. Director McMahon. Yeah, I just had two questions. One is how many users are in this system, and the other one is when you put in a new pump, how long does it last? Thank you. Staff? The users of 
50-ish, I think, probably. It's Jervis Inlet Road, Timberline Road, and Green Tree Road in that area near Earl's Cove Ferry Terminal. So when you get to the ferry terminal just before it, you can turn left or turn right. It's that area in there. Um, and the, you know, the pumps, um, you know, 10 to 20 years kind of thing, uh, depending on what type of pump and what they, what we're pumping. Any, any other questions on this? Director Kroll? Um, thank you. Would, if the road isn't upgraded, could it potentially negatively impact on the cost of the other work being done at the site, just adding to time to get in and out, labor costs and things like that? It, it, it's challenging to get to this pump station, um, uh, but I'm sure during construction they can figure it out by hauling maybe equipment out with an excavator or something up the hill. Um, we currently t maintain this gravel steep road. I suppose part of the project it would have to be put back up to if they damage it during construction it would have to be upgraded. Okay. Director Pratt and then Director Lee. Uh, when you say 50 -ish users, is that current users on the system or projected users once the um, entire area is built out because there's still some development that's happening in that area? I was, I was trying to guess at the number of total users. Yes, there's a lot of vacancies up there, uh, vacant lots. Director Lee? I, uh, I wasn't going to ask all the questions, but seeing everybody else, I will too then. I was curious how much of this um, this uh, budget is for the road. Is is it just a short road? Is it like a fifty thousand dollar road? Is that what, kind of what we're looking at? Um, I believe we had a quote for uh, thirty, forty thousand dollars, something like that, to concrete the the road. Okay, so a small component of the whole thing, long term gain. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Were, was this an improvement district that uh, the citizens had formed and then and, uh, we took, took over that, or was it a community association running it? I, I know it wasn't. I don't believe it was a developer that put it in, but I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly if, if it was an improvement district or not, but I probably. The reason I'm asking is North and South Pender both started that way as well and then were turned over to the uh, regional district. And I believe that the regional district are the right people mm -hmm. to be running it from the quality point of view. Mm -hmm. Once you get over a single user of a well, we need to worry about health and safety. All right. All right, we have a recommendation on the floor. All those in favor? Thank you. We move on to number two. It's mandatory regulatory compliances with Edwards, da Edwards Lake Dam Safety Audit additional funding. So we're coming out of operating reserves. Any questions on this one? <coughs> Sorry, Director Hiltz. Yeah, this is this is almost an Edwards Chapman question. Dur during the Chapman drawdown um, planning, was there an assessment of the facility at that time? Uh, either one of them, it's, it's sort of a, it spans both uh, of the proposals. Um, Staff? The, the assessment of the Chapman Dam was going to be included in the proposed project, um, not for Edwards. So this is looking at the um, yes, looking at the structure, make sure it's safe and what the what we need to do if anything director ties <clears throat> yeah it says here areas affected uh, d but that's not uh, everybody's paying into it is that correct okay yes this is where it's located mm -hmm. yeah anyone like to make a recommendation director McMahon. can i lump the two dams together sure. same yeah. issue mm -hmm. um double dam yeah double dam <laughs> Okay, so, so two items and three. Yep. two and three, I would like to move them to 2020 round two budget, uh, be approved and incorporated in 2020. Okay, thank you. Round Seconder, two. any questions? Director Lee. Are we allowed to do any work on the dams because they're in that Class A park? Yes, we are under our permit where uh, we are able to maintain and, uh, and repair the dams as they are in the state they are in right now. 
Any other questions? All right, all those in favor? Thank you. So number four, base budget increase, construction archaeological funding. And we've seen this with regards to the other water areas as well, North Pender and South Pender. Um, I have one question. Are we, are we exploring having a standing agreement with the Shishalt Nation with regard to archaeological um, work that needs to be done on all construction that happens in the regional district? And the reason I'm asking is, is District Seashell, we actually did that. We took a, like, here's a yearly, whatever, we have an agreement. I don't know if you can do that here or how that would happen. Yeah, we can, and um, we can explore that further. Um, there is a long-term arrangement with the archaeological um, uh, monitoring company that's preferred by the nation and um, those agreements are in place in their multi-year. Thank you. All right, what would directors like to do with this recommendation? Director Hiltz. I'm going to practice my number one. Uh, that the following budget proposal be approved and incorporated into the round two, 2020 round two budget. Thank you very much. Any comments, questions? All those in favor? Sorry, do you have a question, Director Todd? Okay. Okay. So number five. We don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Thanks. So, so just do it in reverse order. <laughs> okay. <laughs> number five, confined space document review. Again, we've seen similar with North and South Pender. Director Todd. Yeah, I mean it's obviously a thing we have to do and it's life safety related, so I'm going to move option one on this, that the budget proposal be approved and incorporated into the 2020 round two budget. Seconder? All right. All in favor? Question? Sorry. Question? Uh, a question for staff. Um, as, as capital projects go on, is there a, the desire to create less confined spaces rather than more confined spaces in the design work to, to minimize these um, ongoing expenses and hazards to workers? Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, you'll see in another proposal that's put forward today for PRVs, we're working towards above ground pressure reducing valves and eliminating underground PRVs so that it's more like a hydro kiosk. You'd walk up and open the door. There's no confined space. Okay, should we do that vote again? All those in favor? Thank you. All right. So uh, moving into the business continuity mandatory items. So let's see. Where does this one end, or is it all of them? Is it all of them? <laughs> no, up to 17. So let's look at 6 through 17. I know. So let's look at, start looking at number 6. Six is base budget increase for operational supplies. Any questions on this one? Pencils, erasers. Director McMahon. Presumably six and seven go hand in hand because if you're replacing more water mains then presumably you need more supplies or is that, or are the supplies for number seven rolled into that estimate? Thank you. Number six is more of the uh, the regular purchase type of operational things, where number seven is is an increase in, in water main installation construction. It's a little bit different. So six indicates it's for things like chemicals, piping, you know, miscellaneous supplies. Right. So it, it's whether or not we'd go ahead with seven, we would still need six. So and seven is the um, capital director or Hilt. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering about the relationship between there is the extension of the supplier one of the some meeting ago we um, there was a the supplier was the contract with the supplier so this is a how does that contract affect this number 
Thank you. So the, the money spent in that contract would uh, generally be covered by number seven, because number seven, again, is talking about installing water mains, ductile iron, valves, fire hydrants, and that's what that uh, contract was about, where those, those aren't generally funded out of item six, or subject six. Director Lee. Uh, what would be the base budget that we're increasing? It says it's we're adding eighty thousand to something. The current uh, budget line item is three hundred and thirty thousand dollars. It would be increasing it to about four hundred and ten thousand. Any other questions on this? Does anybody have any questions about number seven, if we're going to look at doing these two together? Sorry? Can we do, take care of number six first? Okay, number six first. I'll, Director Pratt. I'll move uh, number one that the following budget proposal be approved and incorporated into the 2020 round two budget. Is there a seconder? Seconded. Any other questions? All those in favor? Thank you. So number seven. This is with regards to water main replacement. Director Ties. Yeah, I'm just curious what the base is now, and I know it's been hasn't been increased for a number of years, and so that I can get a relative number of that six hundred fifty thousand dollars. Is this a five percent increase or a a hundred percent increase? The current line item is six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and we're asking for another six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And wasn't this where we said we had I don't know how many millions of of cost in assets? Who put their hand up first? <laughs> Director McMahon, Director Lee. Okay, I'm just wondering how, how, how much old water main we have that's in fairly dire need of replacement, like Chaster Road being a good example. Thank you. We currently have identified, um, and we currently have a plan developed, uh, a staff where uh, we are saying that in the next several years we need about uh, 13 million, 13 and a half million dollars of projects to be replaced. And uh, so this project, based on the current funding, we are able to do that uh, between now and 2033. Uh, so with uh, the proposed increase, we can uh, complete that work in uh, less years by 2027. So it is ultimately is really a service level decision. Um, the risk of leaving some of these water mains longer in the ground uh, will most likely result in more emergency repairs and leaks. Um, and in some cases, it is the work uh, we're proposing to, uh, we're considering to replace the mains to increase fire flows because in some areas, uh, development has moved along and uh, the water mains need to be upgraded to. Uh, to ensure that the fire flows are moving along as well. <laughs> Director Lee and then Director Tice. Um, if, if we're fortunate enough to get grants, I, I assume we just won't spend all of it because we only have, I, get, I suspect we have a limited uh, ability to manage a large number of projects. So we probably pick the projects. And uh, what's causing me to think that is if we're doubling the budget, were we not doing much in previous years? So two questions. Uh, I, I'd like to think we're doing a lot every year. Um, uh, an example is Henry Road water main uh, was upgraded this year from Russell to Reed. I don't know if you've driven down that part of the road that was repaved the whole lane. That was one of the projects that was done as part of this. This last year, um, Mason, Mason Road water main asbestos cement was replaced from the highway up to Meyer, down two roads. That's the type of work we've been doing with this, this money. Uh, it's just that we've identified that uh, if we keep at this rate, 
we've already identified projects through 2033 or something like that. So it's a long time that if we can increase the funds, we can replace some more of that water main. So the answer to your second question is, if we get grants, are we going to cut back on what we do? No. no. We'll do more, hopefully. <laughs> no, but we'll probably have some reserves for next year is my thought process if we get lucky. Maybe, or we take on more projects. We've got Director Ties and then Director Hiltz. Well, I really appreciated the, um, uh, the comment that Director Kroll made earlier about their cost of water. And I, I'm curious to see sort of a, the, the average age of a water main in the SCRD, and that sort of would give us a, a good idea as to how, how much we need to uh, invest and at what time. Um, you know, the, the one at Mason Road won't have to be replaced for hopefully another 40 or 50 years, but then there's how much of the other ones that need to be. And so it, I don't know if there's a graph that can be created for to, to kind of say, like, this is when the bulk of the costs are going to happen, and this is, or, or you know, or should, I'd, I'd like to kind of see that. But uh, uh, I think, you know, we, we need to be um, moving along on the replacement because I think all the water mains a lot of the water mains were put in at a, at a similar time, and so now th things are coming up. Uh. Thank you. Um, the average lifespan of a water main is, uh, can be up to 80 years, but it really depends on where it's located. For example, in Chester, um, the, the lifespan is less uh, due to high water levels and, as a result, more rust of the pipes. So it's really dependent on the local condition what the expect uh, what the exact lifespan is as part of the development of the asset management plan for the regional water system in upcoming years we, are, we will do as a uh, condition assessment for all these systems for all these um, water mains so um, we're going to work on this graph you're uh, you're asking for and uh, we we want to see that graph as well because that will really help us with determining uh, the priorities as well as the required funding now and in the future. So just as we just did the stuff for the wastewater, right, and came forward with the, the status, how, you know, what kind of condition all the infrastructure's in, that's the stuff that we're looking at doing for water. Okay. Director Hiltz and then Director Lee. Um, thank, thanks, Jerry. So, um, as I as I note, it's it's just it's not just changing the pipes out. You got to put the road back into the condition. So that's the the piece I'm wondering about is this the economies as, as scope with response to Moti and their their contributions. They get a new road out of it, right? Be, which becomes a provincial asset, which is coming. So, and I'm wondering about that aspect. Uh, it happened in in Pender where there was a possibility, and then we have the accessible shoulders and and trails. So I'm wondering how all that kind of package goes together I, I can't really talk about parks trails but certainly know that Modi is um, enforcing the single lane repair on the roads not just patching anymore so um, it's something like a hundred dollars a square meter to replace roads repaid just the asphalt so it's certainly increasing costs follow up so the, the follow-up is it is um, timing of these projects in terms of uh, asphalt replacement with Modi, is there any kind of a, um, synergies between that? Do you consult Modi? Do, they, do you know which roads they're going to be doing so you can kind of joint venture on, on these uh, sharing costs? That's kind of uh, the alignment of the timing of the projects. To date, um, there has been not a lot of alignment. Uh, we would like it to be more, and um, I recently connected with uh, some senior staff within the ministry to see if we can um, align the projects a little bit better, uh, because I think there is cost savings to be done. But so far, it's really that the SJD is um, is paying for uh, all roads improvements. So I think this would be something that would go in our parking lot. Um, given that we ministry, the minister is actually committed to yearly meetings with us. Let's put this on our parking lot list and make sure that we bring that up during that because there's potential for collaboration on this. Director Lee, Director Pratt. Uh, 
when, when you make the note, let's uh, put a, something about building the shoulder and building the bike pass at the same time. And I, along the same lines, um, paving equipment with the other, sharing paving equipment with the other local governments. It's a good parking lot item. Okay, any other questions about this one? Um, just to add to the town of Gibson's, uh, the Reed Road side, I think that water line runs on the town of Gibson's side. So they're part of that uh, collaboration and sharing of costs along the Reed Road and the, the bicycle lane. So there's add them to the parking lot. Director Lee? I'm a little concerned because there's uh, user fees increase with this one. And uh, well, parcel tax, I guess. Um, we don't have the total picture of what increase we're looking at this year for for water so So um, how would you we, like to put that if in we, here? Yeah, we, we might have to we might have to do some jiggery pokery and uh, This is going through the budget which I'm just sure wondering if we made the right decision Okay, so if we looked at we haven't made a recommendation on this one yet so recommendation three would be that it be incorporated into the budget, but that it be referred back for consideration so that it will come back to us at round two. Tina? So that might be a challenge with something like this. The reason being is because we're gonna have to adopt, we're gonna have to bring the report for the rates and fees on at the uh, infrastructure services committee, which is mid-January. Um, they need to be adopted before the end of the month because parcel taxes need to be in and completed by February 1st, which is before the round two budget. So um, timing, you're kind of butting up against timing. I know it's not ideal. Okay, Director Toth. I'd actually like to commend staff on giving us another option here. Uh, and then it mentions that alternatively this funding could be achieved over two years with 325 this year and then an additional 325 next year. Um, 650,000 bucks is a lot of money to add to parcel taxes. Um, I'd, I'd like to see us move forward with 325 this year. Director Pratt. Um, I, it, it, it's, <laughs> I know we have to, we're going to have to make a decision on this today, but I'm also hearing 13.5 million of waterline replacement that needs to be done. And uh, in, not today, but over the next few years. So it's, um, we, we have a hefty, um, we have a number of, of things still coming down the pike. And um, if, if we do the 650, yes, it rises, it, it, it increases everything, but the 325, I'm, I'm worried that we're going to get caught into the same pattern that we've been in, that we haven't been increasing, and especially when we know we have a number of water lines that do need to be replaced. Okay, I'm just going to comment on that. When I said today, I mean, like, that's dollars that we know today. Yeah. And we've got increases in costs as things go forward. Okay, um, Director McMahon and then Director Ties. Since we have two motions on the floor without a second door, I'd like to add a third. <laughs> I'd like to move that the budget Sorry. proposal be approved and incorporated into 2020 round two. Now the chair can sort this out. I've been second, that second that one, okay. Um, could we do this? Um, I, I know this is more work for staff, and I know we have to approve this by the end of January. If we say we want, yeah, we see both options. We, in, we incorporate it, or if we don't incorporate it, what are the user fees and parcel taxes? Right, so that we, we actually come with two numbers in January, so that we can look at what is the impact and make a decision before we go into does that work? Yeah. Okay. And Remco? My question for you is, which two options do you want to have assessed? Zero, three, 325 or 650? 
Director Pratt? I think from what I'm hearing from the board, I would suggest 650 and 325. I don't, I think we all recognize zero is not an option. Yeah. We need to increase it somewhat. It's just whether or not we do the half or the full. Okay, so now let's try putting a recommendation. Oh. <laughs> Director Ties first, and then, then we'll put a recommendation forward. One um, of the four. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, one thing that I should add to the parking lot is uh, how do we communicate these water cost increases? And, um, and that, I think that we need to have a big discussion around that, um, especially because we're also trying to put in water meters and a lot of people always blame the water meters on, uh, on, on huge increases in cost when really uh, the, you know, we're looking at you know, making up for some lack of investment over the last 40 years. So uh, it's not going to be the water meters fault that our water costs are increasing. It's going to be um, the lack of investment over the last 40 years. So, I, um, I, I, so I've put that on the parking lot, and uh, I think we need to have a big discussion on that. Thank you. Okay, so what recommendation do we want to put forward? Because we've kind of got all over on this one. What you said. I, I will withdraw the motion that I okay. made. <laughs> Director Lee. I will, with, I will withdraw my motion. Okay. <laughs> all right. Director Pratt, would you like to make a motion? <laughs> Okay, now, uh, staff will tell me if I've got this wrong, um, that uh, the following budget proposal with two options, looking at uh, increasing um, the base budget increase of 650 and a base budget increase of 325 over, um, be brought to a round two budget. Is that sufficient? January. January, sorry. Be incorporated into the budget and refer to the 2020 round two budget for consideration. Yes. Is that okay. sufficient for staff? Right, and, and it, I think we may end up doing some of these, a few of these, so it will be in January, we're gonna have some decisions to make around parcel taxes and user fees, looking at the various options yep. that we've put forward, which we would then finalize when we come back in February. Yes. Yes, good. Okay, yep. good, okay. 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 Is there a seconder for that recommendation first? Okay, three of them are gonna second it. Okay, <laughs> Director Hiltz. So that would be the option three that we're kind of looking at then? That's with the Yes. Okay. Okay, Director Lee. Um, it's, I agree with doing it this way. My question was, will we do the wastewater at the same time? Because we got, we've got the asset management for the wastewater to consider and... That would uh, be the next, but the next um, thing we're looking at today. We'll be looking oh, at wastewater. We'll look at today? Yes, we'll be oh. looking at wastewater today. Oh, okay. Okay. Director, uh, not director, the other guy over the other table. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this guy on the other side of the table <laughs> would like to mention that the user, the, the, the approval of the, the user fees and parcel taxes for which for the plants will be brought forward at the same committee meeting as those for the water. And we do have wastewater on our, our agenda today as well, okay? Any other questions about recommenda or number seven, the recommendation that's on the floor? All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you, staff, for working with us on, you know, how to work this forward. We do recognize their implications and that, you know, we have to make some decisions prior to that and it's nice to you work with us to let us see what the impacts are going to be. All right, number eight. Yes, I know, I know. So when I looked at this, I went, no way, not at the end of the day. Uh, number eight, Reed Road and Elphinstone Road water main replacement. Director McMahon. Page 183. I, I am back to the parking lot item about the significance of us paying. To, Elphinstone is a very small road. So presumably if we replace the water line, we end up repaving the whole road. Would that be the case? Yes. It's really nice that we're doing roadies work for them, isn't it? Maybe that's why I got such a... We can just dig it up and then abandon it. Right 
So on, on, our, on our parking lot item that we've listed around roads, et cetera, perhaps you could capture some of these examples so that as we're, when we go have those conversations, we have the examples. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Any questions on number eight? Director Hiltz. Right one. Uh, Elphinstone Avenue, I believe, is, is asbestos cement as well. That was, it's, it's not listed there, but uh, that was my recollection. It's at least not up to our current standard. It can be a different type of, it's undersized and it can be blue proof, which is different, which is not asbestos cement. But it's not up to our standard. And while I have the microphone, um, this is, this budget of 750 is to replace the entire main if there would be no, um, Accommodation possible with the work of the town of Gibsons as well as the town as well uh, uh, the Church Road Well Development Project. If those, so what we're really seeking is uh, we will collaborate with the town of Gibsons, um, and if the Church Road Well Development will proceed, uh, align. We will we'll try to the best of our ability to align the project so that we can uh, achieve as much. Uh, cost saving as possible, especially in the paving, uh, but maybe even in contractors to be hired, et cetera, et cetera. Director Kroll and then Director McMahon. Um, just to back up on the information that Remco provided, the town of Gibsons has budgeted for working on this project collaboratively with the regional district, so we're all looking for where we can save pennies. Thank you. Director McMahon and then Director Hiltz. So we're essentially looking at up to a maximum of 750000 on this project. That's a yes. Uh, Director Hill. Uh, a par parking lot item, which is appropriate because it's BA Blacktop, um, being kind of the sole provider of uh, asphalt on the Sunshine Coast, is there room for the SCRD to negotiate kind of a broader yearly kind of supply contract when these projects are coming forward rather than doing it contract by contract? Okay, that's on our parking lot. Any other questions on this? Yeah, yes. Any other questions on this recommendation? And what would you like to do? Director McMahon. I would be happy to move that that budget proposal be approved and incorporated into the 2020 round two budget. Thank you, is there a seconder? Seconded, any other questions? All those in favor? Thank you. Number nine, Chapman Water Treatment Plant Instrumentation. Again, coming, coming from Capital Reserves. And boy, Area D's got a lot of things happening. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions on this? So it's a one-time expenditure. Any questions? Director Hiltz. Um, I'm not sure if I'm getting the years straight, but there, there seemed to be a previous uh, plant instrumentation lab stuff in the previous budget, is that? I, I can't remember. Yes, you're correct, and that was uh, replacing specifically um, the turbidity meters that are, are off the filters and the streaming current monitor equipment. This is more related to things like microscopes and um, jar testing equipment, UV equipment for the lab. Any other questions on this one? Director McMahon? I'd actually like to move this one. Uh, menu number one, <laughs> approved and incorporated into 2020 round two. Okay. Seconded. Uh, any, any other questions? All those in favor? Thank you. <laughs> number 10, Chapman Creek water treatment UV upgrade. Again, coming from those capital reserves that we were looking at increasing. Any questions on this one? Director Todd. I just wanted to highlight in here that uh, this UV system, when it was installed, had no redundancy built into it. Um, there was no backups. There was no options of, of servicing it while keeping the rest of the system online. Uh, so I'm glad they're looking at adding redundancy to that system. All right. 
So what would you like to do with this one, Director Lee? Um, 14 years doesn't seem very old to me, but is that, you, uh, is that common for UV treatment? That you have to replace the whole thing after 14 years? Well, certainly with this UV unit, we're having problems with the ballasts and the, the bulbs and the O-rings, and from my understanding, they don't supply, they're not making the O-rings anymore, so it's out of date. It's, it's beyond its lifespan. So, Director Pratt, oh sorry, go ahead. So I take it it's a little unusual for this, where could, we could be hoping for better from the next one? I, I hope so, but the way technology is going nowadays, you know, I'm, I'm sure they're making new UV units every day. Director Hiltz. Um, kind of speaking on, on Director Lee's, so the redundancy, there will be two units essentially at the end of this project? So there's redundancy as well as the ability to take one offline and do servicing? We haven't come up with the final plan yet, but yes, the plan is to have a redundancy, either have two large UV reactors, so you can put one on or the other, or having an individual one per filter unit, so that you can take one filter unit offline and still operate three. So the implications, if, if UV goes down, the, the water quality or uh, wouldn't meet guidelines and we would probably be leading to like a boil water advisory if that was to happen? If the UV fails, we have to contact the health officer and notify him and come up with a plan and how we're going to address it and the timeline that the UV will be down. And um, certainly uh, he encourages us to make sure it's repaired and we have to adjust the chlorine residuals. Yes, Director Pratt. Um, I'll move uh, that uh, we do option one on this, that the following budget proposal be approved and incorporated into the 2020 round two budget. Is there a seconder? Seconded? Any other questions? All those in favor? Thank you. Number 11, bylaw 422 update. <laughs> questions? This is actually the work to come back with updating our user fees and parcel taxes. Yes, uh, Remco? Thank you. This is, we, on an annual basis, we update some of the appendixes uh, of this bylaw, including the drought management plan and the uh, um, user fee and, bar and uh, rate uh, specific bylaws. This budget proposal is to really do a review of the core of the bylaw, which indicates, uh, which stipulates, um, for example, our provisions to shut off somebody's water supply in the in what circumstances can we do that? And that also stipulates um, uh, the water conservation strategies that can be applied uh, through our rate structure, et cetera, et cetera. So, at the October 24th uh, committee meeting, several proposals were uh, brought forward on how to streamline um, our process of, for example, water service applications to allow for more water conservation measures to be implemented. Those would be, really need to be embedded in the core of the bylaws. This is, this is to retain a consultant to help us with the review and update of that core of the bylaw. And that consultant, uh, one of the tasks would be to make sure that um, policies and regulations in place in other jurisdictions would be uh, incorporated and used in order to, um, uh, in our review. Thank you. Thank you. So this is actually updating and bringing it into a line with the direction that we're looking at doing in the regional district and with the municipalities around the conservation and how we incorporate that. Okay. Director Hiltz. Um, has the core of 422 ever been reviewed c comprehensively? Not in the last 10 years. So what would you like to do? Director Hiltz. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I'd be happy to uh, move uh, option one for this particular item. May that be approved and incorporated into the 2020 round two budget. Seconded. Any questions? All those in favor? Thank you. 
All right, we're moving on to number 13. Sorry, yes, go ahead, Director McMahon. Sorry, I should have asked this before, but when, when we do a bylaw review like this, that is what it's going to cost us in terms of a consultant, but there is also a cost in terms of internal staff time. So I guess my question was, you know, how much staff time are we committing as we, as we vote each item along, and are some of these when you get the gargantuan work plan that results from this, <laughs> is it possible to defer some of these that are not quite as urgent for another year? It's contemplated, currently contemplated in the work plan, um, recognizing that, um, as indicated on um, in the report presented last month at the infrastructure services meeting. This was one of the items that we currently have listed as uh, to be uh, one of the items for the new manager. Um, if that would not be approved, then we we'll, might be have to delay this project for half a year, and I think there will be not significant impact to the community by doing so. So I think one of the things that has come out in a public meeting previously was that in order to incorporate all of the things that have to happen, we have to look at our staffing complement. All right. Any other questions at this point? So number 12. Thank you for catching that. I, yeah, I wasn't counting right. Uh, this is a Chapman Creek water treatment plant sludge residuals disposal and planning. Paying for it. <laughs> Director McMahon. This is long overdue, obviously. You know, we need to take care of our sludge. Um, I just was wondering, I believe the flocculant that is currently used is aluminum based, and I just wondered, are there other more environmentally friendly flocculants? Staff um, will continue to explore that. However, currently, indeed, it's aluminum based. So there is some aluminum in this sludge, uh, and hence we're not able to dispose of it that easily. Director Hill? It, it, well, I, I have aluminum in me, I'm pretty sure. Um, so it's not a considered a contaminated waste, though. It doesn't fall under contaminated waste disposal um, requirements. It's not required, um, it's not regulated under the Waste Management um, Act. Right. Director McMahon? Nonetheless, I believe that you have to be careful with it because it is uh, not good for fish, so you don't want it getting into Chapman Creek. Director Hiltz? Yeah, maybe it could be used for road base, for going to particular pump stations. <laughs> All right. Um, let's come back to looking at a sludge residual disposal and plan. Director McMahon? Yeah, I would, I would vote that one to, to be approved and incorporated into the 2020 round two budget. Is there a seconder? Seconded? Any other questions? All those in favor? Thank you. Now we're on to number 13. Sorry, Director Hills. Sure. Um, to, to, to help me through the menu, when we do our motions, could we start with option one or two just to kind of, it would, it would be helpful for me. Sure, totally. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, yeah, what Everybody do we got that? Okay, Thank you. thanks. So, number 13, regional pressure reducing valve replacements. Questions on this one? This, yes. Uh, sorry, Director Tice. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, <laughs> since there's three of them, and uh, four. Well, yeah, 
three of them uh, that are required. Um, I'm wondering also if there could be a, like a staggered approach, you know, two year, this year, one next year, that kind of thing. Staff? Uh, yes, is the answer. We could stagger it. Um, uh, certainly the, uh, the peer V stations themselves, if you purchase them as discussed earlier, the above ground ones are approximately $45,000 each. And what's the impact if these, if one of these goes? The impact could be that um, the pressure in uh, residences, houses, or in the water mains at the bottom of those hills would be such that they would explode, <laughs> blow out. <laughs> because it's really at the bottom of the hills where we have uh, large height differences to maintain uh, the pressure at the bottom in those water systems at the bottom to uh, keep them uh, low. Otherwise, due to gravity, they just uh, increase. Okay, so I've got Director Hiltz, Pratt, and then Toth. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, there's some economies of scale in doing it together in terms of purchasing, and that would be the reason to bundle it is from a purchasing point of view? Uh, staff have identified these three PRVs as being in poor condition. That's why they're bundled. Director Pratt. I was just going to comment. I remember last year when we did our staff tour of the um, of this facility, and there was that there was that one section of pipe that had been blown out by pressure because of it had just. Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, it was sitting in the other office. I don't remember. Do any of the other directors remember seeing that? And it just the way it just it it disintegrates. The pipe it's the amount of pressure that's on there director Toth yeah um, has there been any consideration or contemplation given to and maybe this becomes a parking lot item um, these PRV stations replacing them with uh, facility or stations that are capable of generating electricity in that process um, I know the West Vancouver uh, is a lot of their PRVs incorporate generation uh, so they're able to feed that back into the grid to help offset their costs you want that as a parking lot item and then we can sure. go to staff we certainly could look into that these are six inch water mains generally speaking six or eight inch water mains so i i would assume the hydro generation would be minimal okay. yeah i think the other ones that they're talking about they are big they're like big big that they have yeah Okay. Any other questions about this recommendation? I worked on that project. Any other questions? Okay. How would you like to move this one forward? Okay. This side of the table. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I'm happy to move option one. Okay. So that the budget proposal be referred to a 2020 budget. And incorporate, just referred and incorporated. We approved and incorporated, yeah. yes. Director seconded, okay. Director Kroll, did you have a question? I just had, I just had one question. Okay, go ahead. Um, how many within the system, how many pressure valves are there? And is, no, is it just the four we're dealing with, or are there more that could possibly? Be? Yeah, there's more, 19 or something. Uh, it's similar to the water main replacement. Um, program we have we have we've been replacing peer V's over the years to to make them in the past they were just installed um, three feet high kind of thing or four feet high we're putting in modern peer V's that can actually stand up in when they're underground but so we've been doing this program replacing peer V's as the years go by so I believe these are the last of the dinosaurs um, in the regional system um, there's 20 PRVs. Uh, there's more up north, in north and south Pender, but that's just pressure reducing valves. We also have other stations like altitude valves that control the level of the reservoirs, things like that. So there's there's quite a few of them out there. Okay, so we have a recommendation on the floor. Yeah, Director McMahon. As we replace some of these things, are we putting in like new monitoring equipment so that it's easy to easier to remotely find out what's going on in in our system? 
Some of the, the pressure reducing valves do have, um, you can control them through SCADA. So uh, there's one at, in Lee Bay, for example, that we can control, you can open and close and adjust it. Um, so yes, but not all of them. Um, they're, they're usually set at a, at, a, at a rate and then monitored uh, manually. Thank you. Okay, so we have a recommendation on the floor. I'm sorry that it be approved and incorporated into the 2020 round two budget. Number one. All those in favor? Thank you. <clears throat> so that's number 13. Number 14, exposed water main rehabilitation funding increase. Questions? Director Todd? Where is this, where are the exposed water mains located? Because I know this last year you replaced um, Chapman Bridge Crossing. I'm just wondering what other exposed water mains there are in the system. There's uh, several locations, uh, in particular um, Angus Creek Crossing as one, uh, Burnett Creek, Gray Creek Bridge, and uh, a few others. And, and there's more extensive ones over Chapman Creek, which are, you know, more difficult to get to and stuff like that for, you know, ex repainting purposes. Okay. Any other questions? Director Hiltz? Yeah, the, the, the problem, there's seen the past efforts to do this, it hasn't been working out. Um, and, and the seasonality of it is so um, you, you can't paint in December. It's not a good time, typically. So how, how does the seasonality play in, in t kind of scoping these projects and, and, and getting them done? So uh, staff, we looked into that same question because some of these do go over creeks and part of the issue is you have to contain the uh, cleaning material so it doesn't get into the creeks. So there is, you know, environmental concerns that you have to deal with. So certainly we would want to uh, tender this in an early spring and, and, and get to construction during the peak summer period of time when the weather is conducive for the curing of the paint and stuff like that. All right, so how would you like to move this one? Director Toth. Um, option one, uh, that the following, or that the budget proposal be approved and incorporated into the 2020 round two budget. Is there a seconder? Seconded, any further questions? All those in favor, thank you. Number 15, Langdale Pump Station Phase Two. Director Command, Director Lee. Uh, Langdale Pump Station, I believe, is in the upper parking lot at the Langdale Ferry Terminal. So I just wanted to know if there is any impact from the redesign of the ferry terminal. Thank you for the question. No, there is not. We have um, worked over the last year uh, with uh, BC Ferries and MLTI to come up with uh, legal agreements on um, to allow us to have access to this um, site and at all circumstances um, it, and, uh, and to ensure that any redevelopment would not have any impact on our ability to access the site. And one of the things he identified in last year is that, for example, this site does not have a fence around it. So while it is in the middle of a very busy area, um, and it is a community water supply, uh, we have identified that there are some improvements to be made on the security of that water uh, supply source. Um, I'm, I'm looking at on page 191 where you're, you're going from a fixed speed to a, a variable speed and does this have an effect in the support that could be provided to the Hopkins landing system because of the, the difference of the elevations of the reservoirs and is that kind of factored into it that it will be able to supply Hopkins without pushing all the water over the top of their reservoir? 
That's correct. So as part of the VFD going away from a fixed speed drive, it's more efficient because it actually stays, it fluctuates with the uh, filling and draining of the reservoir and as, as well as the demand. And it's also energy efficient versus now where you have the fixed speed pump, you basically it starts and it's pumping full speed, full throttle, full amount of water. Whereas with a VFD, it would fluctuate as the demand requires it. So, so the follow-up is, is the support to the Hopkins landing, so has is, is that been considered in, uh, uh, in the scoping of the project of the support? We did, and we actually, during this last summer, we actually ran a two-day test where we actually, in anticipation of, because we have to take the well out of service, utilized Hopkins water to supplement our water or to feed our system, and it was very successful. So the question is going back the other way, for not Hop, but going from Langdale to Hopkins. If they have a failure to be able to support that, that's... Yes, they, they, we, we would be able to uh, supply their system. Okay. In addition to that, we um, have um, an interim agreement and we're uh, working to work a long-term agreement on, on those kind of uh, emergency supplies back and forth between the two systems. Director Lee. Uh, two, two questions. The first one is you mentioned some 2019 work that was, I think you didn't have enough money to finish it. So have, you, have we already invested more than the 175? So as we looked into the project with uh, both from an engineering standpoint of view and operations input, you know, the scope of the project increased from just the replacement of the well and pump to where we're actually we would be, uh, for example, redeveloping the well. We'd want to do a drawdown test in anticipation to see what we can do for groundwater supply within that area, uh, you know, the possibility of long-term improvements and supplementing our water deficit. So those are some things. And then there were the operational improvements, like I had mentioned, we went from fixed speed to VFD and then the site civil improvements, which uh, include uh, the fencing, like was mentioned, as well as the uh, concrete ramp around the area and stuff like that to make it more usable. And then there is a bunch of piping modifications that would occur within the station. So it's it's really more than just a you know pump and motor replacement. It's an upgrade to the station as the station is aging. It's over 50 plus years old. So it, it just had, uh, I guess what I'm saying is we added more items to the scope to make it more uh, for the long-term usage. Did we spend 175000 last year? No, we year? didn't. We spent no, 175000 this year? Right. We spent approximately, with pending bills, about 20000 of the allocated line item of 100000 so we have approximately, or will, at the end of 2019, about 80,000 remaining of the 100,000. So Director McMahon and then Director Hiltz. So I believe this well, um, it, PC Ferries uses this water, and when I'm on the Queen of Surrey, am I drinking Langdale water? Yeah. Yes, you are. That's why it's so good. And, and so my follow-up question is, does... Is BC Ferries treated like a residential parcel? Are they paying just a parcel tax for the water, or do they pay by the volume, or how does that work? They're, they uh, have a commercial meter. They're billed by the commercial rate. Director Hiltz. Um, I'm, I'm happy to move option one, particularly. this is I, I see this more of an imminent asset failure, which I think is what it was classified as before. Um, so it's, uh, there is no redundancy in this system. There's only one well. Um, so yes, I'm happy to move option one. That the following budget proposal be approved and incorporated into the 2020 round two budget. Is there a seconder? Seconded. Any other questions? Director Lee? Um, I was, I had a note of a possible well field there. And uh, I, I know we have a project to look at new possible well fields, but I, I think I heard that you were testing the capability of it now. If, if it is 
a possible addition to the overall system, this money would be in support of that or would we have to do it again? Thank you for the question and um, thanks for listening uh, the level you did because that's exactly right. We're exploring with this money we can also, with this budget, we will be able to explore, do the well test to, to see if there's future growth opportunities uh, on this, in, at, at this side um, uh, moving forward and um, yeah. Thank you. All right. No other final questions? All those in favor? Thank you. Um, we're going to take a break. It is 10 to 11. We're moving through. It's taken us some time, but thank you for your patience. Uh, how about we're back by 11, or no, no later than 11? We'll call, it, we'll call to order the, or we'll reconvene the open meeting at uh, 101 p.m. We're going to start with a, uh, reviewing the parking lot list that we've compiled over the last day and a half and look at which of those we want to move forward immediately, which are more long-term, basically identify what we want to do with all of these various pieces and work with staff on, on time frames. Yes, Director McMahon. Number one could be an update in an upcoming report, maybe a quarterly report or something. Would that make sense? Tina? Would it make sense to just put this on the screen? Sure. Uh, Cause my colleagues can Sure, that'd be perfect. Okay. So do we want to go one by one through them? Okay. So you have them you have them on yours as well. So perfect. Okay. So number one, bylaw for weekends, probably connected with the bylaw enforcement review. And Director McMahon was suggesting that a future report could come forward. Is there a time frame you're looking at? After Christmas? I don't if there's a regular report coming, a quarterly report or something that would make sense. Yeah, staff. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one of the things I, I'd just like to point out is that we are currently in collector agreement negotiations. Um, currently, the way our structure is, the bylaw officer position is what's called an inside worker, uh, which means they work Monday to Friday between the hours of 8 and 5. So to expand and, and go to weekend shifts, um, we, we will need to address this. We, we have uh, a proposal that's uh, under discussion right now. So um, we, we may need to await the outcome of collective agreement negotiations. Thank you. Perfect. But we still want this information coming back at some point. So, so would you like to say um, after um, collective agreement, the elective collective agreement is, is finalized, we'd like a report back on impact of, for bylaw for weekends, or bylaw enforcement for weekends. Okay, that works. Is there a seconder for that motion? Seconded? Any other discussion on that? All those in favor? Thank you. Number two, Joint Sunshine Coast Purchasing Group. This was actually one of the items that was listed in the uh, light overview. Is that joint, like the whole Sunshine Coast? What is it? Is it something that... Yeah, so there are many local governments that have these type of buying groups, and but the Sunshine Coast, um, it has tried to reach out to be part of, say, the North Shore or the one up at Sea to Sky. So we're looking to partner with uh, the other local governments, larger um, uh, government, so School District 46. So staff have already started to reach out to various individuals on forming this type of um, arrangement. Okay. So is there anything that you need from... No, uh, staff here? are already on it. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then the next one, this came from Director McMahon, Chair of the Fire Commission being compensated. How would you like to have this one addressed? Maybe we could have a, maybe that could be part of a lunch and learn or something that to explain why some positions are volunteer and some are compensated. And 
I, I just had some other questions with HR about how that works. Mm -hmm. Director Hiltz, we'll uh, see what Director Hiltz says and then we'll go to staff. Uh, because it's in the bylaw? Is that, is that like, so the question is why is it in the bylaw to begin with? Okay, staff. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'd be happy to do a lunch and learn and, and share more information on, uh, uh, I guess, fire services in general, uh, explaining the different um, compensation uh, structures we have in place all up and down the coast. But are you looking at having it limited to fire or? Yeah. Well, it was more like we have a lot of uh, committees and uh, of all sorts, advisory committees and they are usually 100% volunteer. So I just wanted to understand, are we consistent across uh, how we treat our volunteers? Okay, so we're looking at how we treat them and if we, they aren't all the same, what has the others be different? Right, yep. Yeah. Okay. The difference Director between Hills. commissions and advisory committees because the West House Sound is a fire commission opposed to, so the difference between those, yeah. And I'd like the information on that too because we are potentially setting up some commissions in Seashelt. I don't think we were anticipating they'd be hit paid, so I don't know. Is that a requirement? Yeah, staff? Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> so what we'll do is we'll look to the bylaw. Um, there is a bylaw for APCs, there's a bylaw for the fire commission. And I think what you're asking is how volunteers in general are compensated or if they're compensated. That sounds about right. Does it work, Tracy? That works for me. Okay, and we're looking for lunch and learn at some point. Thank you. All right, do we need a motion on that? Yes, okay, motion on that moved, seconded. All in favor, thank you. Uh, number four, application revenues versus staffing cost. Possible review. So this came out, yeah, I think that is happening or in process or not. Look to staff on that one. Uh, thank you, Chair. There, this is a project that is on the planning work plan. It has been a number of years, I believe since 2012, uh, since the last time a comprehensive review of our fees and charges was undertaken. So if it's on the work plan, do you need us to do anything with this? No? Okay. Take care of uh, dock and ports review regarding climate change and new use patterns compared to original design. So this is something that actually, it's, it's been on radar here for a bit, but it also came up during the meeting that we had with the Islands Trust people. And they're also questioning the usage and the maintenance of the various ports given the cost of them. And it's particularly pertinent right now with regards to the new Brighton dock because the Squamish are looking to divest it. And so what happens? It's their prime, one of their primary accesses to the island. Does that mean we take it on? And if so, what does that look like? So it's a bigger conversation. I think they want to have a meeting with us around that too, but there's going to need to be a, a bigger look at this because it's, it's very costly. We all recognize that, and they do. How do we proceed? Director Hiltz. Well, well the, the, the idea of the service review and from the wastewater, one of the things in the title says wastewater service review. So I was wondering where wastewater service, comma review, wastewater, comma service review. Right? They're quite they're quite different. Um, and so uh, that would be a question for staff. Was it an official service review or was it a wastewater service, comma review? Because they're they're different. I think it's different between wastewater and docks. Right? Wastewater is a required service. Once we've taken it on, we have a statutory requirement to actually pro you know, provide that. So it's not that can we do it or not, it's how do we do it and what the level of it is. With regards to the docks, they're looking at do we want to maintain all of these docks? If there are two and three on an island, do we do all of them? Do we do one? So it is a service review, yes. Um, and then, so is, is that what we're asking for here? Is we're actually for service review, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. At the at the joint meeting with Islands Trust, a recommendation was made that a meeting be convened in, I believe it was late January or February, 
uh, where staff could provide more information about the service, including uh, some looks at the service that have been taken over the years and bring forward information that could perhaps inform uh, the, uh, our board as well as Islands Trust on options for next steps. And I believe that those, the, the minutes from that joint meeting are, um, we're working to have them on the December. I, okay. They will be on the December Planning and Development Committee uh, and Community Development Committee agenda and uh, the recommendation could be considered at that time. Thanks. If I remember, previous reviews of the ports did not include the question, how do we design docks these days to meet climate change and, and uh, weather needs? And uh, that's part of it. I mean, I, I think it was uh, Mayor Beamish who said, we're still building our docks for Union steamships. Uh, yeah. Yeah, totally. So it's on the radar. It's going to come back. OK, so that one's good. Uh, Moti roads that they don't want to maintain. Reservoir Road, Cove K, Pixton Road. How do we address that? Do we know what roads and how do, is it advocacy piece? Yeah, Director. Um, I suggest that it might be, um, it might, it's, I think it needs to start off as an advocacy piece, as a listing of these roads that we have that, um, the, the Modi roads, Modi right of ways that they've chose to opt out of maintaining and um, start a list of those and, um, and actually bring it to the ministry's attention of, look, this is our list of roads. These are the ones that we consider critical to our asset maintenance um, and to the fabric of our community and we need assistance with them. So I think it starts off as an advocacy piece and a letter to the ministry um, or, well, or starts off with a conversation with our local lead and go up from there. Director Lee. I, I believe we are not talking about Modi roads. Um, we're talking about Modi right-of-ways that someone put a road on, but Modi never agreed was a road. Um, when. <clears throat> when someone builds a road in a subdivision, for instance, it's not a Modi road until it meets Modi standards and they accept it. And I suspect that that's exactly what we did to get to our water reservoirs. We took a cat and built a road. It was a Modi accepted road. Thank you. Um, some of these roads used to be maintained by Modi. So they, at that time they accepted the responsibility for that and they divested this responsibility. One of these roads is also Dusty Road. Dusty Road is an MOT, formal MOTI road, ultimately paved by uh, funding by the SRD. Wow, okay. Yeah. So we should go back at them then. Yeah. So the, I see uh, three things on here, right? Number six is the MOTI roads they don't want to maintain. Then we also have um, Number 20, right? Modi road improvements coinciding with water main replacements. Um, and then 21 as well, sharing paving, road work equipment with other local governments. So that's, you know, when, when we're doing projects, they're doing projects, how do we coordinate those kinds of things? So I think first we need, we need staff to flesh these out a little bit for us, right? The three of them, and then we can take that forward. So it would need to come forward as a report at some point. And director? Uh, so I'll make that motion that staff uh, take um, items 6, 20, and 21 on the parking lot and um, come back to a future uh, committee with a report outlining um, which roads um, and what can be. And what the, maybe what the impacts are what on the, the regional impacts district and potential avenues for collaboration. Yeah, so we Perfect. actually have a solution piece yeah. within um, within the, mm -hmm. the, le the advocacy piece mm -hmm. that we take back to the province. Yes, and then we would move that forward to further conversation with the province. Does that work for staff? Director Hiltz? The, the question I would have is around which, which roads, there's a, there's a number of 8F roads, unimproved right-of-ways, which are public for private access opposed to 
corporate access. So I'm wondering, are we talking about SERD corporate access, or are we talking about general public access to private property? So that's, I would split those out. I think what staff have indicated is some of these roads were roads that MOTI maintained and have chosen not to maintain them anymore. And they have implications for us for access to infrastructure, corporate infrastructure. So I think that we're making a distinction there. Um, Director Pratt and then Director McCann. I think we need to, yeah, we need to make the distinction. We need to go for the critical asset pieces that um, that matter to us the most, the, the residential piece, because I've, I've got a few of those in my area as well. Um, that that's that's a different level this is this is a, a critical piece of um, access to infrastructure and we have when just from the reports we've read today and um, it's uh, there's a number of them that we can be looking at yes for the rural directors understanding our roads uh, a lot more would be helpful um, in our um, mapping, if, is, is there any information about what type of roads each road is, or we, is that strictly in Modi's IMAPs? Because uh, we had a long discussion at our APC about private roads, and which roads are private and what that means, and what's the difference between an unmaintained road and a private road, and it's complicated. That might be a potential lunch and learn or something like that just to get a get a handle so let's start with what we've got here first and then when that comes forward we could look at a lunch and learn potentially and advocacy to the minister okay do you have anything that we could actually put forward <laughs> I, I mean I want to make sure whatever we put forward makes sense to staff because yeah. they're the ones who have to fulfill on it absolutely um, so I have um, that items that a future report, uh, a report to a future committee uh, addressing items 6, 20, and 21, um, identifying which roads were formerly maintained by Modi and now um, not, <laughs> and the impacts that, that uh, they have on the regional district as well as potential avenues for collaboration. And then, yeah. mm -hmm. covers it off. I mean, there's details in these numbers in here. Yes. Okay, you'll love that. Is there a seconder? Seconded. Any other questions, comments? All those in favor? Thank you. So number seven. I think this was Director McMahon as well. Uh, I have seen three or four now different maps of Block 1313, starting with the SCRD's map, then the hydrology report map from the, that um, uh, uh, BC Timber Sales sent to us. Those two maps are different in terms of water courses, and they are both wrong. And then there are, I mean, we're having increasing problems. Uh, so we need somehow to get better data on uh, water courses. It's, it's probably more of a problem in Area E, I suspect, than in a lot of other areas because when you have a very steep topography and there's a big ravine and the creek is at the bottom of it, you know where it is. Uh, you know, LIDAR will tell you that. But in, in other areas, it's really clear that we don't know where the water courses are. And um, whether we want to action this or we want to request better information from another level of government, I don't know. But we're making decisions based on faulty data. Okay. How would staff like to address this? Uh, thank you, Chair. So s staff also are concerned and cautious about the quality of data that is available on water courses. We do rely on provincial data. Mm -hmm. That is the core of our, our data set for water courses. And when we receive or are provided better information, we update the, the data library that SCRD maintains. But because water courses do move, uh, we are all, always careful to specify mapped and unmapped water courses when dealing with development. And, um, and staff remain open to receiving better 
data, which we sometimes do from community groups to improve the information that we have on file. Thanks. Okay. So how would you like to, Director Hiltz? There, there might be some kind of clarification about which data the SCRD actually is a custodian and has authority and which is provincial, right? So is that kind of what you're trying to un understand? I think that's part of it. Also, the names of the creeks are wildly inconsistent. Um, they're different on every different map. And then when you talk to the neighbors, they have a different idea too. So it, it does make a conversation challenging. So, the, so where you're trying to get to is that the maps that are used are actually consistent. So part of it may be where they're, do they identify where they got the information from? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we can uh, make sure that we are making decisions based on accurate data. So uh, I'm not sure how we're going to do that. Perhaps that is an advocacy piece with Flynn Rule. Um, it does have a lot of implications because, for instance, if the hydrology report produced for the logging plans for that block is based on incorrect information about where streams are, then I don't think it's worth the paper it's printed on. So it just happens we have a meeting on Monday. Could this, could this be something that we bring forward on Monday in our meeting with Flynn Road? Thank you, Stan. Thank you, Chair. Um, it could be item of discussion. What I know is that the province is responsible for official naming of watercourses. Um, and they only do that one, once a uh, water license is issued for one of those courses. Um, in terms of mapping, we use the provincial map, uh, mapping as uh, indicated by GM Hall as, uh, as our baseline and if additional information. So we try to make, we try to provide <laughs> you with the best information mm -hmm. we have available. If others are using uh, data that uh, might be of lesser quality or different quality, uh, that's I think something we can flag in future reports. Mm -hmm. Yes, Director McMahon. As an action item for me, I will go back and look through the reports because I found one that actually appeared to be accurate, and it may have been the stormwater report that was done in 2009 for area ENF. And, but I will go back and look through the reports. So this could be something that we could bring up on Monday, but it sounds like there's more to be done around this going forward but not necessarily ready to do that at this point? No, okay. Uh, next one, number eight, relationship between parks and recreation, who does what, lunch and learn. So that, I think it's pretty straightforward. We wanna do a lunch and learn on parks and recreation. And I think we're looking from, from, in looking at the organizational chart, I think we're looking at two components of that. One is planning, and the other is operation, or maintenance and operations as well, because there's two components, right? And who does what? Lunch and learn. I'll make that recommendation. Second. All those in favor? Okay, perfect. Next. Base budget increases. How do we want to handle them going forward? Oh, is there an automatic inflation increase? So this is a policy piece that came up during the discussion. Director Pratt. I think this might be one that's best handled as we do the budget debrief after we've finished um, round two and passed the budget and um, and talk about that so staff has plenty of time to prep for going into 2021. Tina? Thank you, Chair. I just want to go back to um, Lunch and Learns. We do not need resolutions. We'll make notes for Lunch and Learns. Thank you. Thank you. And Tina, did you want to talk about this? Yeah, I've already made a note for budget debrief. Okay. So Again, we don't need a resolution. You could make one, but uh, well, staff have already noted it. Okay, Dr. Hiltz? Um, yeah, the, the kind of term that I'm hearing is budget principles. It's not really a model, but it's like, what are the principles and is that, a, as Director Tyson says, is that a principle that we follow through the budget process? And yeah, that's, that's kind of the term that I'm seeing out in the municipal land. 
It would be a, the, well, it could be assumptions, well, budget assumptions. So the things that we that form the basis for budget deliberations. The assumption is that we will do a base budget increase for, you know, utilities or CPI or something, right? That kind of thing. Was in the past, not okay. And so Tina's got that on her list. We're good there. Next one. Are there like more like sanitary wipes around here? <laughs> <laughs> Number 10 is reducing travel. So a number of us use Zoom, use Skype for certain meetings that we do. I mean, personally, I, I work for my mortgage offices in Calgary. We have mortgage brokers across the country, and we do regular weekly meetings using Zoom. And they work great. We have our underwriters, our lenders, come on and do, um, you know, updates for us on products and stuff. So we're wondering if it's possible to do that for things like the agenda review meetings, right? Rather than having directors come in, you know, Director Lee comes in from Pender, takes him a while to get here for maybe a half an hour meeting. Then he goes back, right? So it would reduce cost, it would reduce time on everybody's part. Is that something that we could look at? We, we have it. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we do have that technology available. So oh. we, we could do that. Easy. Okay, Director Hills. So the question is, does the SCRD have a Zoom subscription that we could use on our own? Is that what you mean, or it has to be in this building? Oh, uh, we definitely have Skype capability. I, I would have to look into Zoom. And we have access in the Cedar Room and the Arbutus Room. We do. Okay, so I think we'd like a recommendation that staff... Uh, investigate the possibility of using technology such as Zoom or Skype for um, agenda review meetings and potentially others. Yeah, seconded, and Director Hiltz. Um, this, this issue is brought up at the ports monitoring as a place where to use some kind of technology to allow people who are not close by to participate. So it's, I, I believe GM Hall might be looking at it from a ports monitoring side. Okay, perfect. So, I mean, we're open to using the technology is what we're saying. And we want to see if it's available for others as well. Thank you, Chair. We'll investigate it. Okay, thank you. All those in favor of the recommendation. Thank you. Uh, understanding of fire apparatus. Again, lunch and learn. Tour the halls with bows of Holly. <laughs> Director Lee. Did I? Reducing travel? Reducing incentives to travel by paying. Oh, sorry, there's another one in there. Uh, reducing incentives to travel by paying electric mileage costs. Okay. I haven't heard that in the. Yes, this was my item, although it doesn't sound quite the way it sounded at the time. Oh, um, sorry. I, it, while we were pointing out that the current system of mileage incentivizes people to drive more. Yes. And, you know, when we are looking at uh, uh, ways of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, this should be reviewed. So uh, I don't know if there's a, a happy place to hang that. Okay. Director Lee. I'm reading an article right now. Electric cars offer no savings in energy, money, or emissions at present. Electrical supplies from renewables cannot cover but an insignificant portion of road vehicles. And there's lots of reasons, including weight of the batteries. Mm. You're not comparing apples to apples right now. Mm. Um, if you have a low mileage car. And mileage is not just the gas either. It's the maintenance on the car. It's the tires. Insurance. Insurance. Yeah. Um, so I'm opposed to this. It's okay. too early. And we have not actually seen what's going to be the ultimate cost for electricity. Okay, we're having trouble hearing you with your microphone. Pull your microphone a little closer to your mouth. Oh, we have not actually seen the actual cost of electricity used to uh, fuel an electric car because they don't have the same taxes mm -hmm. as the uh, carbon-based. Um, they're paying for the roads right now, mm -hmm. not the electric vehicles. So. We have, it's pretty early to start making um, statements like this. Sorry, I, 
I apologize for putting that in there. This is a whole different discussion. <laughs> yes. Director McMahon, let's take yeah, us back that, on track here. That is a whole different discussion. Okay, what what type of vehicles people are driving, but our our policies for reimbursing travel encourage people to take individual cars rather than use transit or carpool. And maybe that is something that we should look at when we're looking at corporate policies to try and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Director Hiltz. I, I, what, what I think I mean, Director McMahon says, how to incentivize non-driving. That's that's rather than incentivize driving to de-incentivize the driving. Okay, so let's back this up. I'll come to you in a second. What, what I'm hearing is our policies encourage people to drive. When, when we reimburse people for mileage, typically we're supposed to be reimbursing them for the costs that they have incurred to do whatever it is they've done. So if you're carpooling, you don't necessarily have a cost, but it is paying the person who's driving the cost of you know the gas and using the tires and the insurance, et cetera. I know that there for those who do it regularly, they actually can make money doing it. And so I, I know my my son bought a new truck and he figured it out that because he has to he has to go to Edmonton once a week, it will pay for his payments. Right? I mean, so you can get people who do that. Is that what our policy is doing, is what you're saying? Is our policy set up so that people are incentivized to actually drive rather than do, than carpool or use alternative sources of transportation because of the policy we have in place? I don't know how we get to the bottom of that. That might be something for me to take to one of the climate, or the climate change forum or one of the climate action committees. Maybe that's the way to go at it. Perfect. So we don't have to do anything here at this point. You'll bring something back. Okay. All right, we got it? Okay, understanding of fire apparatus and lunch and learn is what we're looking at. So again, staff just make a note, lunch and learn for that one. No, yeah. <laughs> no holly, yeah. Uh, vehicle maintenance collaboration with other local governments, especially electric. So, District of Seashell has vehicles that we take in for maintenance. I don't think they come to the SCRD, right? We take them somewhere else. Is that something that we could be exploring? I mean, I know that if we're looking at having a location where the SCRD and the District of Seashell are on the same site, it would make sense that our vehicles get maintained by the, by the SCRD and we pay the SCRD for that service. We're paying somebody. Might as, well, might as well be the SCRD, particularly if we're together. That will have impacts for staffing, right? And I think that's that's what this is looking at. How do we, the SCRD has maintenance, mechanics. I mean, it doesn't make sense for the district of Seashell to necessarily get a mechanic if we're in the same place. How do we do this? Yeah, staff. No, um, yes, we can always explore that. And I think that can be part of the uh, more broader discussion about collaboration on um, services that are currently housed at the Mason Yard facility. Okay. Director Tides? Yeah, I was thinking vehicle maintenance at Mason Road and then joint and then parks joined at, at you know, Dusty Road and something like that. It's just... Whatever. We have, we have eight acres on Dusty Road. Okay. Any other questions, comments about this? So staff will be looking at this. Director Hiltz. So, so a, a bit of a question. Where, where, where does private sector and public sector services, you know, I'm, this has been an issue in local governments that, so now the local governments are competing with the private sector to do support. So is there a legislative aspect? Are we supporting, not, not, we're not supporting private sector, but I'm, I'm just, how, do, how does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, good point. Don't know. Director Pratt. I was going to say, it's not so much legislative as it is an ethical, more of an ethical issue. I wouldn't say it's a legislative issue. So just to provide a little history without going too far down the, down 
the weeds here. So one of the main reasons why the regional district uh, has a fleet service is because of the transit system. The majority of the reason why that facility and everything was built and the reason why we're even debt servicing is to maintain the uh, transit system. So that's uh, probably about 70% of what they do from a cost recovery perspective. Um, so we just have to be mindful that that's really the purpose of that particular facility and, and the majority of the reason why those mechanics are there. Um, yes, they do maintain the regional district's fleet as well, but it's not their core business and it's not the core reason why they do that. The regional district is also one of only four uh, operators of the transit service. Um, and so we'd be hard pressed to, uh, like we don't have a market uh, like an urban system to go out and contract that service out. Um, so that's why historically we are doing that ourselves. So, so it's not just the fleet part, it's, it's mostly because of the transit. Director Lee. Uh, when I was working for uh, TELUS, um, they have hundreds of their own vehicles and uh, they actually quit doing their own maintenance on the cars. They did do their own on the uh, safety equipment like the man lifts and stuff, but they, they limited it to the specialty. It's not a cost effective way of doing the maintenance on uh, smaller vehicles. So, so this would, so this sounds like it, it's a policy decision that we'd, we'd want to look at. Yeah, staff. Well, I, I would look at it uh, probably here on the coast as perhaps it is a specialty right now. That was my point. I don't know if there's any place else to get it. So maybe we need to be the specialty. Staff can look for introduce as part of the fleet uh, review that's going to be undertaken anyway. Right. Because the other thing is all of the governments on the Sunshine Coast have, I know we do, we have heavy equipment. Right, we just bought a new grader, right? We just, you know, all those kinds of things. So it might be that there's, we look at a certain line, right? This part goes locally, this part goes to regional district. I mean, inside of that, that's a good plan. Inside of the, the whole fleet policy thing, we look at the maintenance piece. And it's important to use local businesses. Yes, and it's important to use local businesses, definitely. All right, the next is the fleet electrification report, which is coming as part of that fleet plan. Is that correct? I'll just check with staff. Yes, he's nodding yes, okay. Um, organics recycling for commercial operators, impacts of our and provincial policies and what can be done. All right. Do, do you, okay, anybody want to tackle this one? That, Director Pratt? It, uh, it's irritating that um, that we can't help uh, support, uh, or we can't take uh, commercial out of the waste stream. So I think I'd like to see, I'd like to know more about how we can do that as a region and whether or not it feels like there's a little bit of uh, provincial policy that's directing this. And, um, and I'd like to know more about it. So whether or not it's a staff report to a future infrastructure meeting or whether or not it's the subject of maybe a lunch and learn and to get an overview of what um, to further flesh that out on how the commercial looks. Okay, a couple of the background pieces on this is that Recycle BC does not take commercial uh, recycling, right? That's one piece. Yeah. The other piece that we were looking at was organics depots up and down the coast and the fact that small businesses need a place to dispose of their organics should we do a ban on organics at the landfill. So what we want to look at in, is, in this is how do we deal with this for our commercial customers, small commercial customers, given the impact of the rules and regulations on them. Is this a topic for PMAC? Or not? It is a topic for PMAC. It's a topic for PMAC. It's not a topic for TMAC. No. <laughs> well, there's an impact on this on this no. the landfill. PMAC plan. is reviewing of the current solid waste management plan. This is future solid waste management plan, so that's why it's not so a topic. So later. Okay. What I can what I can talk to you about is in the January uh, in January we're going to bring back a um, or as discussed yesterday during budget. 
there was a question about small um, small commercial operators and um, vendor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We will include in that. Um, we will prepare a report to be brought back at round two budget, where we include some description on the small business and we what we know about the bigger commercial businesses we will include in that report as well, just for information. Okay, does that work? Yep. So we don't need a recommendation on this one at this point? Okay. Yes. Has, has, <laughs> leaking? Hmm. Got her attention, didn't I? Uh, um, for the, the scope of the report, um, can um, um, the limitations of a regional district in offering services to businesses versus residential? I'm still not clear on, like, can you, can we have a services for commercial businesses? That that's what, whether that's in the scope of the report is my question. And staff, would that be sort of part of addressed in there? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right, um, next one. Gibson's an area, no, GAC. Gibson. Sorry, 50, I dropped right over to one of time. Regional solid waste, including operating reserve based budget increase review due to reduction in tipping fees, wood waste, and no reserve in place right now. This, this is to do, okay. Um, we have fixed costs at the landfill. As we continue to divert uh, stuff from going to the landfill, even though we've got fixed costs, we actually are having to then either up our tipping fees or up our user fees to do that. And we don't have any reserves in place. How do we deal with that whole, I think we're looking to get a, a handle on that whole bigger picture and what some of the implications would be. Sorry? Price of success. Price of success, yes. You could even label it the price of success. See, we, see we've, got, we've come up with a title for the, for the report. It's called the price of success. Okay. The price of success of garbage. Um, what I suggest to, <laughs> I'm going to suggest a different title when we bring back a report. <laughs> um, but um, this might be an, a topic to be included in uh, a future report on tipping fees of the landfill in broader um, and I think we can include there. Um, yeah, period. Thank you. <laughs> so this <laughs> will, we, we will bring back a report on tipping fees on the, uh, at the landfill and what they cover, what they're not covering, and that kind of stuff. And the bigger implications. Yes. And the organ and the impact of organics um, collection and ban. The impact of organics were already assessed and included in a previous report, yes. and we will uh, include that in this report as okay. well to bigger. Do you need us more. to put a recommendation on the books for this one? We can. Yeah. Okay. Maybe there's a report on um, a tipping fee update report uh, will be brought forward as a future committee. Yes. So moved. Okay, seconded. Okay, and then there was a comment? No? Got a question. Question. Not about this. Okay. Motion. Okay. okay, all in favor of this motion. Thank you. Okay, and Director Toth. I may have missed a report or a meeting or something somewhere along the line. Uh, I'm just, but following up on the solid waste, I'm wondering if there was any discussion about synchronizing hours between the landfill and Salish Soils as the receiver of the wood waste. Um, Salish Soils isn't open on Sundays. Uh, the landfill is. Uh, and the landfill is closed on Mondays. And Salish Soils is open on Mondays. But, yeah, so I, I can see somebody on their weekend going to take all their stuff to the dump and going to take their wood waste in and being turned away at the dump with the wood waste on a Sunday, but not being able to take it to Salish Soils. Just wondering if that conversation ever happened. Thank you. No, there was no report on that. Um, the item, it, we haven't received a lot of complaints about that to date from residents. Uh, nor that are showing up at Salish, nor that are showing up at Landfill. And we are aware, uh, we, but we are aware of the fact that there might be some concerns there. Uh, but so far, 
we haven't received a lot of complaints there from the community yet. And the, it's not included in the contract we have with Salish. And revising the hours at the landfill, there's a reason why it's open, why it's closed on Monday. Salish is open on Sundays during the summer, though, I believe. During the summer. During the summer, which would, would maybe alleviate some of this. Well, I guess we'll have to monitor it over the, yeah, okay. All right, number 17, further discussion, 16, energy use daylight. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to get through it quicker. <laughs> number 16, energy use daylighting not suitable as an emergency shelter, yes. Okay, the energy use thing could go, you know, as part of our uh, exploration of how we can reduce our energy consumption. Um, the the part, it, it is a huge building. It's ideal in most regards for use as an emergency shelter in, t in case of earthquake because it has showers, it has a commercial kitchen, it has everything you want, except it can't be used. And so my question to our emergency services people is, why can't it be used and there's anything we can do about that? Thank you. Uh, we can certainly look into this further. Um, we have a wide variety of uh, options when it comes to emergency shelters. And my understanding is that this is on the list as a potential for an emergency shelter. So this is the first time I'm hearing that it's uh, being referred to as unsuitable. So um, I, I'm not sure where that comes from, but uh, we can certainly follow up with our uh, manager of protective services in that regard. Did you want to put that in as a motion that we'd like information back? You just do it? Okay, it's being handled? Okay, perfect. Okay, number 17. Further discussion on establishing a parks capital budget for $100,000. So we do not have a capital budget for parks currently. Yes, yeah, staff. Uh, thank you, Chair. So staff took from the discussion uh, during the earlier part of the meeting yesterday that further information out with an overview of the services of parks, the assets that are managed, uh, would be helpful uh, as part of round two. So staff will, are prepared to bring that forward. Okay, so we don't need a recommendation or anything. You've got it handled. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Piston bully. Next time consider leasing, it says. <laughs> staff. So uh, the regional district or, or local governments don't typically, they don't lease programs or they don't lease uh, any anything. We have what's called the municipal finance authority. And so it is by far the cheapest way to borrow. Um, and that's actually the equipment financing. So over the last few months, you've seen actually at the last corporate services meeting, you saw a recommendation for uh, that program. So that's what's required as part of that. And so it's very, it's very similar to leasing an asset, but we own the assets at the end. Uh, where leasing, you typically have an option to get rid of it or to, to replace it. So um, that's... That's not financially, um, we're in a much better position. All right, next one, number uh, 19. I'm not going to read this as it's written. <laughs> so how do we communicate water cost increases? We went through, we spent the morning looking at uh, spending on water we tend to hear in the community that the cost is blamed on meters. The cost of, so don't do meters because they're part of, it's part of the issue or whatever. So we're looking at what kind of communication plan are we looking at around getting the information out about the water upgrades and capital costs and projects that we're doing besides just water, uh, water meters, uh, wells and reservoirs. They don't know about all of the other stuff. How do we communicate that out? I would just add that this is possibly part of the budget communications plan. If we have one, do we have one? 
staff can, um, based on the, uh, once the budget is finalized, staff can, um, can provide, uh, do some intensive communication on the water projects that are approved and why they are approved and, and uh, what the benefits of those would be for the community. For example, I think we were all surprised when we heard $13 million worth of, of water main replacement projects that are on the books to be done that need to be funded, that we aren't funding. So it's, it's the premise a lot of times behind some of these that need to be communicated out. Director Ty. Yeah, I think key is here is um, that we do some sort of forward-looking communication that we're saying this is what's coming at us over the next few years uh, so that people are prepared to say, oh, okay, we knew this was coming even before we put the water meters in. Um, th that's kind of where I think might be where we need to close the gap rather than saying, we just spent this money. No, we need to say we're looking at increases because of this. And that's, I think we need some, some and that's where a lot of that asset management that hasn't quite been completed yet um, will be helpful. But um, I think what we know, we should communicate. Sherry? I just want to say from the corporate side of the house, corporate communications, we, we will be working with staff on all of these major projects and it is our practice to develop communication plans going forward. And I think, you know, having been through one AAP on meters, we ha and I talked to hundreds of people, and I think we have um, a good idea of some of the challenges and some of the messages that we need to get out there. So we'll be very focused on that. Thank you, Director Graham. It would be interesting to do a visual because people always say water is free. So you have in the free column water and then everything that isn't free, <laughs> like dams and pipes and treatment plants and yeah. Yes. All right, number 20 we've done. Number 21, sharing paving road, I, we talked about this a bit, right, with regard to the Ministry of Transport, but I think we also want to talk about other governments. Are the, is there other uh, paving road work equipment? The conversation was, and in the next one, right, BA Blacktop Monopoly negotiations for annual contracts, is there something we can do among the governments around this? Uh, Tina. I believe that was done last year. Um, or this year, what year are we in? Uh, 2019, there was a discussion about trying to do some of that, with some, especially with some of our water projects, um, because we knew that other companies um, were oh, coming. Uh, yeah. Or 22? yeah, but I think, it, it, I think she's talking about 21. Yeah, yeah, so I think we have tried some of this. So 21 and 22, I think there's there's a little bit of synergy with those two which is we have tried to do that. We have negotiated with VA Blacktop before, but I think this is a unique um, instance where one of the challenges we came to was that they have the only uh, plant here on the coast. And so to try to get someone else here, you can't get the asphalt at, at the, the right um, condition. To, as you passed certain geographical location. I'm, I'm treading into a, but this is what our purchasing division said. So it's a challenge. And we've even tried to go up north, so come from Powell River, but I understand they're in the same situation we are. Okay, so staff are looking at it and working with it and communicating with the other governments. Okay. Yes, Director Hiltz. Um, the, the reason I, I brought this up, it, we, when we were sitting in some interviews, there was a gentleman who was talking about this negotiation that happened in a local government in the interior. And uh, that, was, that was the idea that I had heard. I have also heard the, the monopoly aspect of BA Blacktop and on this side versus Vancouver Island. And uh, it puts the local governments in not a very good negotiating position. So that, that's where the idea came from, is from, we were all in the interview, I think. Staff? Staff will look into this further once we develop um, 
also in light of the potential collaboration with Donald Gibson's uh, along Reed Road and et cetera, et cetera, in the area. And I know there's going to be work collaborating on trail, for example, in Seashelt. So, I mean, we're going to be ripping up a big piece of, of Trail Avenue. If there's work to be done there, that's you know, important to note. They actually start next week, I think. Uh, next one, 23, tr pressure reducing valves and using that pressure to create electricity. And I think some of the directors have already sent information forward. So, food for thought. Staff will review the information and follow up the appropriate. Perfect. <laughs> Number 24 and 25, I think, are part of a further conversation uh, going forward when we look at implementation of the uh, water meter AAP piece, right? So it's, and I think we've already had some of those conversations. Um, number 26, water level measuring field trip. Oh, yes, yeah. environmental flow needs. Yes, when the environmental flow need piece happens, we're going to do a field trip. We'll send you an invite. Thank you. Bring boots. What's that? Bring boots. Will you need boots? It might be a little lower if you don't. Okay, that's not what it sounded like you said from over here. Oh. A discussion around asset disposal, Director Toth. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering what our current policies are around asset disposal. Uh, I regularly spend a bunch of time on BC Auction, which is the government surplus site. Um, and I saw that the regional district recently was getting rid of some what appeared to be serviceable vehicles, as well as a bunch of scrap metal and other stuff, but it was all lumped into one bid over on the BC bid site. And so I'm just wondering why staff go one way versus you know the other way, how we dispose of our assets, because I know that stuff on BC Auction tends to fetch a fairly good price. Yeah, so I think this is where uh, internally we're, we're addressing that. So essentially having a policy and a procedure together. Um, what we're faced with is that at the end of the year, a lot of divisions have not embedded the disposal within the contract. So we're kind of left with a whole bunch of things all at once and so we kind of do this annual cleanup the last little while so we're just trying to you know make room make space because we don't really have anywhere to store this type of stuff because the space so it's being looked at to see what what the best way and best course for these types of and they're they might be different depending on what the asset we're disposing of is because um, for instance uh, fire equipment might go to you know volunteer fire department so it really depends so we're working on it all right anything else that's come up during these discussions that we need to bring up or are we finished with our list director Pratt not so much something that's come up but um, something that's uh, trending in my community is invasive species and um, and I know I've heard about it from other directors at the table as well. Um, and um, if we can get a comment from staff on if we already may have a line item on this or if we wanted to bring something, if what the board wanted to bring, ask for something forward is now the time to do that. Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. <clears throat> so SCR, there is currently a regional planning-led uh, project to look at a regional invasive species strategy. And the status of that project is we have a draft uh, strategy. Staff did some technical analysis and following board direction have referred that out to our advisory committee committees and um, members of the intergovernmental uh, working group that supported the development of the strategy and we're awaiting comments back. Uh, included in staff's technical comments were th was that as the regional district does not have a, ser a service that deals with certain parts of the invasive species, uh, I don't know, 
supply chain, I guess, if you want to call it that. Uh, we have responsibility for certain aspects like corporate lands. We have responsibility for solid waste disposal. So we, there are things that we can do within existing services. There are, are large portions of that, of that chain that we do not have uh, authority or mandate to do at the current time. And so pending feedback that received, um, which may be in time for round two, uh, the consideration could be given to whether uh, if the regional district wants to do new or different types of things that require a new service or particular initiatives within our service area, uh, then those could form uh, new budget proposals. Thanks. Director Pam. I would certainly like to see this government and all the other governments um, clean up their own corporate properties. We have not weed in Shirley Macy Park. Town of Gibsons has it near Public's Workyard. Public, I can't talk anymore, Public Works Yard. And I suspect Seashell has some somewhere too. And that wouldn't be a bad place to start. I think the, the biggest issue right now that I'm hearing, and I think this is what Director Pratt is referring to as well, is that, you know, we, the District of Seashell, we actually hire uh, a construction, like a landscape architect, landscape person kind of thing, to come and get rid of our invasive species. They come and they remove it, but they have no place to dispose of it. They're having to take it off coast. So it becomes a real challenge in dealing with that. So. That's what they're looking at. What do they do with it? We have people who are willing to take it, but where does it go is the, is the issue. Yeah. <laughs> Sir. Yes. Burn it? We don't have a place to burn it right now either. Yes, Director McMahon. In theory, uh, Elphinstone Aggregates is taking stuff and burning it. So I think that'll be part of the report, is to options for disposal. Okay, anything else? No, anything from staff? All right, perfect. So I'd like a motion to go in camera um, under 91A and K of the community charter. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Yes, give our gallery a moment to leave, yes. Yes. Yeah, I am.